I've built over 50 apps with AI, and every single one starts the same way, with three documents. Not code, not tutorials, just three files that tell AI exactly what to build and how to build it. Today, I'm gonna to give you the entire system, the exact prompts, the exact workflow, everything. So with that being said, let's get into it. Okay, so one big caveat to this video is I'm really targeting people that are non-technical. So the way that I talk about this process and the tools that we're gonna use is going to be from the non-technical lens. So you don't necessarily have to know code or anything about code. The only three documents that we need are going to be the spec, the blueprint, and the to-dos, all of which have their own reason and all of which are gonna be created by AI with our assistance. We'll walk through each one of these in detail on how to make them and why they're important, but quickly to walk it through, we have the spec which talks about what we're building, the blueprint is how we're going to build it. And then to-dos is going to act as a roadmap for AI so it stays on track. And we'll start with the specification. The specification is the seed of everything else. This is where all other documents grow from. And the way that we're gonna create the specification is actually through an interview. So we're gonna give the AI a very specific prompt and it's gonna ask us questions about what we want to build. So it'll ask us a question, we give it an answer. It asks us a question, we give it an answer. We go back and forth probably 15 or 20 times. At the end of that interview, it's going to produce a specification, which is going to be what we're building. Now, what's the prompt that starts off this entire interview? Well, it's here. But before we get into that, I wanna give a quick shout out to Harper. So Harper drafted this blog a little while back that walks through some of these prompts in the overall process. So I'll link this in the video description so you can easily get access to these prompts, but also I'll link my presentation so you can get access to those as well. So what's in this prompt? Well, first off, we're asking the AI to ask me one question at a time. This is key because we don't want it to give us a bunch of questions at once. We want one question at a time. And the goal is at the end of this interview, we're gonna have a step-by-step -step -step specification that we can pass off to a developer. And right after this prompt, you're gonna put in your idea below that. So you're gonna share your idea to the AI. So either you wanna make a minor automation for something so you don't necessarily have to update a form, or you wanna create a small application that helps you do data analysis or visualizes data for whatever reason. You wanna give it the idea of what you're trying to create. Hey there. So if you're enjoying this, you're probably gonna enjoy these two things I wanna share with you. First off, below is a 30-day AI Insight series, completely free. You'll get 30 insights in your inbox so I can apply AI to your business and your work. The second thing is if you'd like to work with me, below are a series of offerings to see if there's a good fit between the two of us, such as a private community for business owners and leaders, or one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. So with that being said, let's get back to the video. And it's important in this section that you likely use dictation. So you speak to the AI instead of type because we wanna give as much context as possible for the idea itself. And after you've given the idea, you hit enter and then you start the interview. Now, sometimes the AI will ask you questions that you don't necessarily know the answer to. If that's the case, either you can ask the AI to give you choices to choose from, or you can outsource that to the AI as well. You can say, hey, I don't necessarily know the answer to this question. Can you please just answer it based off the constraints I've given you previously? And it'll answer its own question and then move on to the next one. Now, one critical thing I wanna share with you when you're going through this interview is a lot of these AIs, they can be overly ambitious and they'll want to help you create the most robust application ever. That's not what you wanna do. You don't wanna create an enterprise ready application. You don't wanna create something that has a bunch of multi features inside of the product. What you want is a very basic version of a simple product that solves your specific problem. You wanna start small. So think about the very simple thing you're trying to do and you want only that inside the product, no matter what the AI offers you, because the AI will offer you a bunch of other features that will sound good and interesting, but will make the complexity of building the application much more complicated. So just remember, keep it simple. Now, when doing the interview, I recommend using ChatGPT, specifically the auto mode inside of ChatGPT. Reason being is that we don't wanna wait forever for the questions to be asked, but also by using auto, we get the benefit of the AI determining how much reasoning is needed per question or where it needs to think about questions harder. Because if you set the interview to thinking to start with, you'd probably have to wait 45 minutes for the interview to be completed because the AI is going to think very hard between each question. But if you do auto mode, it's probably gonna take between 10 and 15 minutes. With that being said, at the very end of the interview, you can actually switch from auto to thinking and then you can ask at the very end for the AI to then finish the interview and create specification in thinking mode. By doing that, you're gonna get the best of both worlds. You're gonna have a fast conversation with auto mode, but when you intentionally switch it to thinking at the very end of the interview, you're gonna get a very thorough and in-depth specification. And the prompt you would put at the end of your interview is actually inside of Harper's blog again. So you would just copy and paste this prompt here, and that's gonna be at the very end of your interview, and it's gonna then produce that specification for you. Now we'll move on to the blueprint. This is the how of how we're gonna go about building the product, and it's gonna be the core component to our application. And when creating your blueprint, you wanna use a very high-end model. So it's either gonna be GPT 5.2 thinking with extended on, 
or it's going to be Gemini 3 Pro, or it's going to be Claude Opus 4.5. Right now, that's right now, but in the future, it'll probably be some other high-end model. And another thing is you want to make sure that that AI has a very long output window, meaning it can talk for a long time without stopping, because we want an in-depth blueprint as in-depth as possible. I've A-B tested all three, and I found that Claude Opus 4.5 is by far the longest output window and is usually the most detailed when it comes to this document. So I usually use that model for the blueprint. And all you need to do is paste in this prompt, and then right below this prompt, you copy and paste that specification that you got from ChatGPT, and that's going to go down here. Let me actually zoom out a bit so it's not so crunched up. So first off, we're asking the AI to draft a detailed blueprint step by step. We ask it to break it into iterative chunks on how to build the product. And we're emphasizing the importance of making sure that each piece of the build is small enough for an AI to implement and, sa and safely test. And then a really important piece that makes this prompt amazing is that inside of the blueprint, it's not just going to tell it how to build it, but it's going to give you a series of prompts that you can copy and paste into the AI that's going to generate the code for you. And then one addition that I've added to this prompt after Harper's blog is this one here stating that when we do testing, I don't want to necessarily use mock data. I want to use real data and real API calls when necessary. And this avoids the AI basically creating a bunch of tests, passing the tests, but the app still not working the way you want it to. And then, like I said earlier, at the very end below this, you're going to paste your specification from the previous ChatGPT conversation. And once you've done this, it's going to give you a really long blueprint. And I'm actually going to show you an example of one that I've created a little while back. So this is for a YouTube performance dashboard I was creating. And this is the blueprint. So right above this is the prompt that I just showed you. So this is that prompt. I paste it in. And then right below that is the specification for this build. So it then gives me back the blueprint. And as you can see, when I scroll through here, you'll see we start out in phases. So each one of these phases has a series of steps. And each one of those steps is a prompt that you can copy and paste and give to an AI to code up for you. And the AI is going to have access to all three of these documents, the spec, the blueprint, and the to-dos. So when you copy and paste this over, it's going to see all three as well as that prompt you've given it. And trust me, this makes it so much easier because all you have to do is basically just do copy and paste a bunch. Earlier in the prompt, I emphasized the importance of testing. Now, testing is probably the most important thing for any AI to ensure that it avoids and mitigates as many errors as possible. So you want to ensure that in your prompt and in your blueprint, your AI is emphasizing the importance of running tests after it builds a small piece of an application. So it'll write the code, it'll run the test, and then oftentimes when it runs a test, if it errors out and there's an issue, it'll self-correct and it'll actually fix the code before you ever have to do anything yourself or ask it to do something for you. And that's our blueprint of how to build a product. Now we move on to the to-dos, which acts like a roadmap. And this is really important as well because with an AI, its memory starts to fade, kind of like this visual. And over time, what happens is as the AI is working on your product and your application, it starts to forget what it did and it kind of goes off the rails. So what we need to do is we need to consistently, consistently on a reoccurring basis, bring it back to what it's working on and what it's done and where it's headed. We're simply grounding it in the macro. And the way that we're going to create these to-dos is we're simply going to copy and paste this one-liner at the very bottom of our blueprint. So again, I can show you an example of the one that I created here. And mind your eyes because this is really big, so I'm going to scroll quickly. And you can see very at the very bottom of this, this is the end of the blueprint. And then below that, I copy and pasted this one-liner. All it's going to do is it's going to turn this blueprint above into a detailed to-do list. So down here, you can see we have all the to-dos for each one of the phases. So we have the phase, and we have the step, and we have the associated checkboxes as well. Now, it's important that we're asking it to create checkboxes inside of a markdown file because we're going to, again, copy this into its own file. And then the AI can check off each one of these boxes as it's working. So as its memory gets refreshed, because again, we're going to refresh the memory in, in different conversations every time, and it can check these boxes off as it works. And that's important because what we're going to do is after it builds one of these steps, we're going to start a new conversation, which means we're refreshing its memory and it's, it doesn't know at all what it's done. So when we refresh its memory, it can look at this document, it can look at the blueprint and the spec and see, okay, I see I've already done this. It's time to move on to this next second step. So we've basically created a way to extend the AI's memory of understanding what it's done and where it's headed. So I've talked a lot about the process because in my opinion, I think the process is always more important than the tool. But I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, what tool should I use to actually do the code generation? Well, you're lucky because I made a video dedicated specifically to that topic. So you can check out that video. I walk through all the different tools that are available for vibe coding and specifically choosing which use cases are best suited for and also which technical levels you're at and which is most suitable for your skill set. So this is the thumbnail. If I click this, you'll see that the title for this video is Every Major Vibe Coding Tool Explained in 15 Minutes. So you can go check out that. And if you don't want to watch that, and you just want to get my opinion right now, I'd recommend using Cursor. Reason being is that it's not, it's not as easy as some of the other tools, but if you're serious about creating an automation and or a product for your business, 
I'd recommend starting with Cursor because it's the easiest place to start because of the UI and the way you can interact with it. Some secondary runner-ups and recommendations would be Replit Agent and Google's AI Studio. The reason I don't recommend either of these is that they're useful, but they're good at building prototypes and not necessarily something that's production ready. And also Google's AI Studio is limited just to Gemini, and that's never a great option because you want to have multiple models you can pick from when you're coding. And talking about models, let's talk about specific models that I use today. And it's important I'll emphasize today. So this will change in a month. These are my current go-to models when I have AI code for me. But like I said, models change all the time. And as they're changing, we need to A-B test and figure out which ones are the best for our specific use cases as they advance. My current go-tos are these three. So right now, Codex GPT 5.2 is my daily driver. And I'm constantly surprised by its ability to one-shot really complex builds when I give it an entire phase. So I'll give it in that blueprint, I'll give it maybe a step or a series of steps. And in one go, it'll likely build that without any errors. I'm consistently surprised by this. The beautiful thing is if you already have ChatGPT subscription. So if you have the $20 subscription with ChatGPT, all you have to do is download the plugin for Cursor, the tool that I just mentioned earlier, and you can download a Codex plugin, and it allows you to use OpenAI's model inside of Cursor. You don't have to pay anything extra. So that's always a win. After that, I use Opus 4.5 quite a lot for front end. So it's very good at having good taste on what front end should look like. And then finally, I use Gemini 3 Pro for really big bugs, trying to solve bugs that other models can't fix and or testing things in the UI. So I can often have Gemini 3 go off and click buttons in the UI, see if something works. And if it doesn't, it'll collect that errors and it'll feed it back into itself to fix. Those are my three go-tos. So I just mentioned errors and errors are something that will happen. It's important to note that when you're working through these automations and applications where AI is coding it for you, you have to be persistent. And you have to be persistent with the AI, having the AI fix that issue. You wanna take that lesson after it's figured out how to fix it and you want to embed that for future AIs to ensure that they never make that same mistake. And most of the time, the reason these errors occur is based off of the AI's knowledge cutoff. So what do I mean by that? Well, an AI is trained at one of these model labs like Anthropic, Google, OpenAI, et cetera. And after it's trained, there's a cutoff to its knowledge because they stopped training it and they gave it to you to play with. So anything that happens after that date, after it stopped being trained, it has no idea that it happened. So it's on you to say, if I'm, if I'm coding with an AI, and there's some sort of API I want to use. So if I want to use, uh, for instance, I want to use one of Gemini's models, like their new model, Gemini 3 Flash, the AI likely has no idea that that model exists. So I need to feed that AI documentation stating that it's important that they use this new API and nothing else. And hopefully it works and builds it that way. But sometimes it'll work against the older versions. It'll think that Gemini 3 Flash doesn't exist and it'll code against Gemini 2.5 Flash and think that that's the only model that exists causing a lot of errors and issues. Once you persist and get past that and have the AI fix it, you then want to embed that lesson into all future AI so it doesn't make that same mistake. And the way we're going to do that is by having the AI do it for us, adding it to a file. So let's say that our error happened and we coded up against Gemini 2.5 flash when it should have been 3 flash. Once we figured out this and we had the AI fix it and we were persistent with it, we're going to say we, want, we need you to add this to a specific file so all future AIs references this lesson and never makes it again. And depending on the tool will determine the file you have the AI add that to. So this is a simple prompt that I'll give to the AI. And you can use dictation as well, just asking it verbally after it's fixed the issue. And you can say, hey, we figured out how to fix this thing. Now, what I need you to do is I need you to update said file. So if you're using Claude code, it would be Claude.md. If you're using cursor specifically, it'll be the .cursor rules file. Or if you're using codex inside of cursor, it's going to be the agents.md file. So pick and choose based off of that. If you're following the instructions I'm giving you now, you're probably going to use the agents.md file because you're using Codex. So you'd say, hey, we just figured out how to fix this. I need you to update the agents.md file with the lesson that we just learned. Make sure that this is written briefly and very information dense. I want to make sure that all future AIs never make the same mistake again. And I'll emphasize this part here where we're saying we want to make it brief and information dense because over time, you'll incrementally add more and more and more to this file. And you want to make sure it's not too big and taking up too much space in the AI's memory because every single time you interact with the AI, it's always going to look at this file. And that's how we embed the lessons. And then the last thing I wanted to call out is bigger chunks. So in the past, probably probably four months ago, honestly, with these models, you couldn't necessarily copy and paste entire phases into them. Instead, you had to go prompt by prompt like I mentioned previously. So I showed you those prompts in that blueprint. I would have to copy out the prompt, have the AI finish that prompt, open up a new conversation, copy in a new prompt, have it start do the same thing. We'd have to work through prompt by prompt one at a time. But these newer models, depending on the task and the complexity associated, you can actually say, instead of doing prompt by prompt, 
I could say, I want you to do this entire phase, do all of phase one. And it'll probably take between 25 and 45 minutes to complete. But again, with Codex, I found that it's very good at consistently getting it right the first time. So even though you have to wait a good amount of time for it to finish, it's usually worth the wait. Now, remember, this is the system. These are the three documents. So we have the specification, which covers the what we're building. The blueprint is how we're building it. The to-dos is our roadmap. And the key thing here is choosing the right tool, the right model, and most importantly, being persistent with the AI to ensure that it can fix the problem. Once it fixes it, you take that lesson learned, you then embed that into your file, either agents.md, cursor file, or cloud.md. So any future AI doesn't make that same mistake. And that's it. So if you enjoyed it, two things. First off, blows a 30 day AI insight series completely free. You'll get 30 insights in your inbox so I can apply AI to your business and your work. The second thing is if you'd like to work with me, blow a series of offerings to see if there's a good fit between the two of us. Now, you've got the system, but here's the thing. Around message 15 or 20, something weird happens. Your AI starts forgetting. It ignores your instructions, and it even starts making stuff up. I made a video showing you why this happens, and more importantly, four ways to fix it. It's right here. Go ahead. Check out that video. I'll see you next time, Internet.